did you say you want a revolution? Yeah. Did you say you wanted a revolution? Yeah. Well, good. Then you came to the right talk. Let's start off today first, though, by defining what it means to be a revolutionary. So Webster's defines revolutionary as someone who does something radically new or innovative outside or beyond established procedures or principles. Now, I don't think any of you are gonna argue with me when I say that Martin Luther King was a revolutionary. No, so much of what this man did was radically new, and the work that he did changed the course of history. But what if I told you that my friends here, Akeem Leonard and Sherry DeCastro, are also revolutionaries. Sherry is working to eradicate childhood illiteracy here in the BVI with her organization, Right to Read. She's not only teaching kids how to read, but through her new and innovative approaches, she's teaching them to learn to love to read. And Akeem and his company, Greencrete, makes these amazing concrete countertops and other creations using bits of recycled glass that he gathers about. But he's taken things a step further, and he started a recycling program at the schools there in Virgin Gorda, teaching the children some of the early fundamentals of what it means to recycle. These are revolutionaries. Uh, over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk to you about these six core principles that are spelled out in the famed Beatles song that you heard me walking up to. So, Let's see here in the next 15 minutes if you can't find your way to live a more revolutionary life. Now, in 1968, when John Lennon decided to write the song Revolution, it was an incredibly tumultuous time. The Vietnam War was well underway. John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Martin Luther King was assassinated. It was troubling times. People were upset, people were protesting, people were angry, people were taking to the streets. But some of the key messages in the Beatles song was that it's good to take to the streets and it's good to have your voice heard, but do it from a place of peace and change the world for the better. Change the world, change the world, that is big. That feels huge, <laughs> but it doesn't have to. I wanna encourage you today to think differently about how we wanna change our world. Have you heard of the ripple effect? So it's through the ripple effect that I decided I would change the world. So I'll tell you a little bit about my story. From a, from a very young age, I was always pretty altruistic. I loved helping people. It brought me so much joy. I knew that somehow, whatever it was I was doing for work, I had to be finding a way to help people. As I stumbled my way through different professional endeavors, I finally landed myself as the founder and CEO of a company. Now I realized what was so cool about changing the world through business was that your ability to impact so many people uh, became more and more possible. When you're impacting the world one-off, 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 you are making a difference, and I encourage you to continue. But when you do it through business, it's as far as your business can reach. Now the ripple effect piece came to me as I evolved through running Jen Green, and I came to my next calling in life, which was helping other entrepreneurs starting their businesses. And what was so cool about this for me was that I realized my reach and my ability to impact that many more people continued to compound upon itself because now I wasn't just reaching those that I was working directly with, but all the people that they're reaching as well. I use this as a kind of a visual example. If you imagine through Jen Green, I'm, I'm touching and talking to the people in the left-hand side of the screen. And in my current role and in the role beyond, it's endless, the amount of impact that I can have. Maximum impact, 
the ripple effect. That's how I chose to change the world. Now, this amazing revolutionary, who we're all quite familiar with, I think says it quite well. And I do hope that each one of you are just crazy enough to do it. Well, when you talk about destruction, don't you know that you can pass me out? Who found the love in revolution? Did you see it? You saw it. Love is at the core of what makes a revolution good. I want you all to consider the positive impacts that revolution can have. Too often our minds immediately come to some sort of negative connotation we have with the word. But the word love is right there. It was there the whole time. Now here in the BVI, I really want us to start focusing on building each other up, not tearing each other down. It's so important. We rise when we lift each other up. Now, I don't mean lifting each other up like this. This is not what I mean. I mean lifting each other up like this. Helping people, one at a time, get to where they're trying to go and achieve the goals that they're trying to achieve. When he gets to the top, he didn't just get to the top alone. No, all of these people get to celebrate and his achieving his goal of getting to the top. They were all a part of this win. This is what we need to focus on. This is love. Now, an awesome example that I've seen really recently of this love was during the biz pitch competition that we held here in January. During this competition, we had six competitors, all rock stars in their own right. It was a tough competition. There was a lot of money on the line, opportunities on the line. And as I sat on the sidelines, I watched, and I saw the most incredible thing happen. As each one of those competitors came on and off the stage after their pitch, they sat down next to their fellow competitor, and I watched them put their arm around each other. I watched them high five one another. I watched them pat each other on the back say a few words, you did so good. And then in the end, when the judges had to pick just two, there was a perfect opportunity for the other four to have gotten really upset, have been jealous, called foul, what have you. But no, there was this genuine joy for Akeem and Chad for having won. All six of them were so supportive of each other at the end of the night, they all felt like winners. I was thinking more of this. This is revolutionary. This is love. Okay, so when it comes to solving big problems, You've definitely got to have a plan. Now I say that when you focus on whether you're building a business or you're starting a new project and you want to tackle this whole changing the world thing, focus on solving real problems. When you're solving real problems that are helping real people, the efforts that you take around solving these problems are actually made easier by the collective energy of the whole of the people that you're helping. And I love, Tom Patterson once said, if you plan your work and you work your plan, your plan will work. I wanna talk about a big problem. Let's use this as our example, a health crisis. Whether it's the rise in heart disease and diabetes, the, the increased number of cancer, or whether it's a, a a hospital system that doesn't seem to be meeting the needs of these people that are ailing. How do we solve this problem? Who's gonna show up to solve this problem? Who wants to solve this problem? I ask you to look inside at this point and think about what are my gifts? What are my talents? What do I have 
that I can bring to the table in any little way to help solve this problem? Well, let's just use an example like food. I don't think anybody's going to disagree that having a better diet and having more access to affordable fruits and vegetables at affordable prices uh, couldn't help things like diabetes and heart disease and obesity. And let's say you have a green thumb. Let's say you love to garden. Well, I challenge you to consider to start farming. Do something you love and in a way that you can help solve a bigger problem. Now, she's going to start her farm and she's going to grow amazing fruits and vegetables that are going to become available. But she's only half the process. We need somebody else who's going to show up who owns a box truck that's sitting in the back of the land not getting any use and is going to say, you know what? I will be your distributor. I will take that food from your farm to the restaurants, to the groceries, to the hotels. That will be my role. I will take it from point A to point B. Now those two entrepreneurs and their new endeavors, they're going to be quite successful. Not just because the problem they're solving is huge, but the problem that they're solving belongs to so many people that the collective goodwill of the people that they're helping with this will carry them through to success. Are we doing what we can? Are you doing everything you can to help your community? What does it mean to make a contribution? You know, I love this one particular lyric because it resonates with me quite well. Where I'm from, in Fort Collins, Colorado, we believe really heavily in the philosophy of giving before you get. We consider your community equity to be based quite heavily on how much you've given. You know, this whole concept around your life is not as great of, as, as much as you have, but what you have given away. And in Fort Collins, I think that we've come to this realization that it's not about also just giving to wait to receive. It's giving without expecting anything in return and waiting and allow the universe to return back to you when you need it the most. Now, I think one of the best parts about giving before you get is that it doesn't return its dividends overnight. It takes quite some time. And because of that, opportunistic people who may come into your world, who try to give a little bit, give a little bit, and they're ready to take, and they're waiting, no. It weeds them out naturally. Because this takes time. It takes time to see this all come back around. And so, in order for this to actually work, you gotta be in it for the long haul, which leads to the strength and sustainability of the give first attitude and why it works so well. Now, I wanna make a suggestion around this while I'm on this topic, because quite often people don't realize how to help one another. And I'll use an example of uh, something that happened to me at one point recently. And I had an entrepreneur who came to me and said, hey, Cherise, you know, I really, really want to get my food product on the shelves of the grocery stores in the United States. Who do you know? Can you help me inter introduce me to somebody? And I was like, yeah, you know, let me think on that. I will get back to you. I didn't have time to think on that. I got a lot going on, as everybody does, right? I wanted to help. I love this person. I wanted to help, but I didn't have the tools that I needed to help her the best. So, let's do it again, the right a way that I could actually help. Hey, Cherise, I could really use your help. I'm trying to get my product on the stores, on the shelf of the stores in the States. Who do you know at Whole Foods Market that may be a buyer, and potentially in maybe this area of the store? I do, I, you know, I don't know any buyers at Whole Foods, but I do know a couple of people that, that will know. Let me just make a couple of email intros. 
uh, and I'll let you take it from there. Ten minutes later, I've made two email intros that could change the course of history for that person. But it was because of the specificity of the request that I was able to most effectively and impactfully assist and help that entrepreneur along their way. So consider the specificity of the things you need help with when asking for help, and I guarantee you'll get it much better. I also want you to consider what you're contributing. I do believe if you contribute back into your community and into your world from a place of your giftedness and with your talents, it will come much easier to you. Not only is there great benefit in giving in your talents because you're able to actually cultivate your gifts and manifest them in all kinds of new ways, but you'll find this intrinsic joy doing these tasks that are asked of you that you wouldn't if this wasn't something you were comfortable with. And I use the beehive as a great example because within the beehive, every bee has their own role. And it's critically important that these bees play within their role and in their talents. From the queen bee to the worker bee, they all depend on each other for survival. I hope that you start to learn to see each other and depend on one another in the same way, because we are critical to one another's survival. But if you want money for people with minds that day, well, all I can tell you is both of you have to win. Haters are gonna hate. Just be ready for it. Expect it. Wait for it. Learn to grow from it. I always, you know, I've come to this conclusion that haters don't hate you. They're hating on themselves because you are a reflection of who they wish they could be. I also recognize that we can sometimes turn that whole mentality even on ourselves and self-doubt starts to sneak in to our ability to believe that what we can do is truly possible. This revolutionary said it quite well. I believe if everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. One of the things that happens with haters, and especially haters that are duplicators, is that when haters try to duplicate, they're going against one major cardinal sin, in my opinion. And it's best said by my good friend, Mr. Mead Malone, who says, you do you. You will always deliver the best you. And those haters who are duplicators have not settled into the comfort zone of them doing themselves yet. They think they're gonna find their way to success through doing what others have done. But no, in fact, they're the fish. You're the monkey in the tree. And don't stop to think for a second, too, that that hater won't hopefully one day stumble their way into their understanding of the importance of you doing you. Now, as everybody tells you, that's a dumb idea, don't try, somebody did that last year, it was, wasn't successful, just stop. What if we stopped when everybody said that this wasn't possible? Where would we be today? Not where we are. So don't stop. Just keep going. Free your mind. You are the master of your own destiny. And don't think for a second that this life you live is not 110% in your control to make it what you want it to be. I get really tired of listening to people talk about how 
I can't do this and I can't do that because of my friend, this, because of my family, because of the government. These people are not your source of your problems. And you can't expect them to solve them for you either. It's up to you to take charge of your life and make it what you want it to be. Changing the world, giving before you get, making your contribution, all those things are decisions that you're gonna have to make and that you're gonna choose to do to change the course of your life. That's who's gonna save you, not these guys in the boat. The other message within that lyric that really resonates with me is this idea around group think. Now I want you to recognize that it's only through somebody pointing out that something needs improvement from the first version of itself that anything ever changes or is made better. So don't be afraid to speak up, to point out and say, that could use improving. But don't be the guy that says, problem, problem, I see a problem, and sit back. No, be the guy that says, problem, and I have an idea, can I come help you fix that? I see a problem. You know what, I've got, I've got something that I think might help. Be the guy that wants to help solve the problem. Don't just point at the problem. And I want to finish today with one of my favorite young revolutionaries, Malala. She says, let us make our future now and let us make our dreams tomorrow's reality. Come on, BVI. It is time for our revolution.